Namaste, and welcome to the second part of Right View. So, the first thing that I want to cover in detail is how do we get this wrong view of reality? And the answer is social conditioning. The social conditioning begins at birth, or even before birth, with the incidents that happen in the womb. If you do uh, primal therapy or any kind of deep therapy like that, you can recall incidents that happened while you were in the womb that actually patterned your mind. Uh, they sink deep into the physiology where they're kept stored in the tissues of the body. And these traumatic incidents then condition us to a certain world view. Uh, a wrong world view. And what is that? You are an individual. You are this body, or maybe this mind. And you have a certain name. Huh? You belong to a particular family. You are a citizen of a certain country or region. And this is your language, this is your nationality, this is your religion, this is your culture, and so on and so on and so on and so on. Huh? Right from birth, immediately the parents begin loading your mind with all these stories. And they are almost without exception completely wrong at least from the point of view of enlightenment, which is, to me, is the only point of view that matters. Because enlightenment gives you a relief from all suffering. So the point is that these stories, because they're wrong, huh, they're like the wrong theories of the scientists going into the laboratory and doing the experiment, and it fails. So what happens is we go into life, which is like the laboratory, and we perform actions, which are like the experiments, huh? and they go wrong. They fail again and again and again. But we don't give up the stories that we've been taught because we don't know any others. We don't do the research. You know, it always amazes me, for example, regarding school, that people go to school uh, and parents give up their children uh, without a fuss to strangers who are going to be patterning their minds for six to eight hours a day, every day, for 12 years or more. Huh? And they never do the research to find out what the school is all about. How was it developed? What are its design goals? What were the intentions of the people who actually created the school and so on? So they don't realize that the school was created by industrialists to train workers for their factories. That's all. Huh? That's the real story. They're not giving you an education. They're training you in obedience. That's all. That is the design goal of school. Huh? So similarly, all the different stories and theories and explanations of reality that we're given by our parents and friends and society and so on and so on are not the truth. Huh? They're stories designed to achieve certain social goals that are considered desirable. Basically, they want to have good citizens, good family members, good workers. Huh? Why? For their benefit. The parents, in the old days when people lived on farms, uh, or around here, <laughs> people still live on farms. They want to have nice big families. Why? So the kids can work in the fields. 
So the kids are taught from a very early age how to work in the fields, and that's their duty, and they must do it for their parents. Even if they have no inclination, no interest, or no talent at it, still they have to do it because that's the story, right? That is the, the benefit for the society that they live in. And similarly, all the other stories that were told have similar origins if you look into them, if you do the research. Now, let's get to the biggie. <laughs> the big story, the big lie that we're all taught is that we live in an objective universe. In other words, there's a world, huh? this big container, and inside the container, there are all these objects, huh? things, and these things have a separate, independent existence, and they interact with each other according to certain scientific laws, huh? which are always true, and so on and so on and so on. The whole ontological structure of objective reality, uh, scientific truth. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's so wrong. It's so completely wrong. <laughs> because there is no proof for the existence of objective reality. Look, go to any university that has a philosophy department and go to the head of the department and ask him this question. What is the proof for the, uh, the existence of objective reality? And they'll either kick you out of there <laughs> or if he's honest, he'll say, well, there is none. There isn't any proof. There can't be any proof. Why? Because there is no other reality, no other universe, no other world to compare with this one to see whether or not this one is actually objective. The only evidence we have for the existence of the world is our subjective consciousness. Isn't it? I don't care if you're a big scientist and you have this laboratory with all these machines and you're, you're measuring the electrons and positrons and muons and neutrinos and all this other bullshit. <laughs> Somebody has to read the printout. Somebody has to analyze the data and say, this is what this means. And that is a human being with consciousness. Now, Albert Einstein, he was a tricky old guy. He slipped this in to his theory of relativity. Huh? That all motion is relative to the observer. And what is the observer? A conscious living being. Very few people notice this, but he slipped in consciousness to his theory of relativity. Because the observer is always a conscious living being. Even if he's using machines as extensions of his senses, ultimately the observation has to go into somebody's consciousness. Otherwise, did it really happen? <laughs> we don't know. We only know when we become conscious of it, isn't it? The old saw about did if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, did it really happen? Well, you may see some evidence that it happened later on. But if nobody was there and nobody heard it, it didn't happen for all practical purposes. So this is the thing about reality. It's not objective. It can't be objective. It can only be subjective because only conscious living beings are the proof of anything. Huh? How do we know the, the world exists? Because we see it, we're conscious of it, we know it, we experience it. 
How do we know that this happens or that happens or what somebody said or what somebody did? Only because we see it. And if nobody saw it, for all practical purposes, it didn't happen. So this is the thing. We have been told this story. We have been given this explanation of reality, which is completely false. And then so many layers of abstractions have been built on that foundation, which is wrong. So actually, the whole human society and all human knowledge is a house of cards built on a false foundation. It's all illusion. It's all wrong. And this is what we call wrong view. <laughs> huh? And this is why your life doesn't work. This is why you aren't happy. This is why you can't get what you want. This is why things don't go the way you think they should, and so on and so on and so on. And then you start telling stories to yourself about yourself based on these false stories that you were told earlier. And of course, then you start driving yourself crazy because it's all false. It's all wrong. It's all lies. It's all bullshit. <laughs> so because of this, now, when people try to meditate and they still retain these wrong views, of course the meditation fails. Of course they don't reach enlightenment. Huh? They, they don't, they can't even reach concentration because their mind is so turbulent and out of control that they can't focus on one thing for more than a few seconds at a time. So this is the difficulty with wrong view and this is why people can't meditate and this is why they can't reach enlightenment huh i mean yoga so-called yoga the way it's taught today is a joke you know they're told first of all you don't need to follow any rules and second of all you can do the asanas huh and you see them doing asanas and they're always moving Huh? They're going from one to another, to another, to another, never staying in one more than a couple of seconds at a time. I've seen it. I've watched these yoga classes on, on YouTube and stuff. Huh? What does asana mean? It means a seat. When you're in a seat, you sit and you stay. You don't move. So the yoga asanas... You're supposed to stay in them and not move. That's how you get the benefit. But people are doing them like calisthenics. Huh? They're moving from one to another to another and never stay, not, never stay still. Well, what is that all about? That's not yoga. Not even hatha yoga. So this is why, see, all these stories are wrong. And to find out their origin, you have to go back to the source and find out what's really going on. The real yoga, hatha yoga, there are eight stages. Nama, yama, sorry, and niyama come before asana. What's yama and niyama? What to do and what not to do. And the very first instruction of yama is Find a guru. Surrender to the guru. Become a disciple. Before there's any, any even asanas or anything. huh? So if you eliminate the guru from the equation, it's not yoga. It's not even hatha yoga. What to speak of karma yoga, jnana yoga, whatever. huh? Yoga starts from having a guru. Upanishad. Uh, the oldest books next to the Vedas themselves are the Upanishads, which are extracts from the Vedas. What are they extracts of? Upanishad. Come close and sit down. Come close to a master. Come close to a guru. 
sit down and hear. Why? <laughs> to counteract your wrong views and get right view. That's all. So, real yoga begins from the Upanishads. And Upanishad, come close to a guru, sit down and hear. Om Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum.